All right. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Thank you for attending today's webinar event. My name is Connor Carlin, Vice President of Sustainability for SPE, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we kick off, I just want to uh, review a couple of small housekeeping items. Um, the audio will be muted for everybody uh, except for the presenter. If you have questions or comments, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, not the chat window. Please use the Q&A feature. We'll address all the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, this the recording, uh, the webinar today will be recorded and it will be posted afterwards in the SPE library. Everybody will receive a direct link and a follow-up email. Now, today we're thrilled to have Josh Bachman and Pam Burkle of Cascade Energy to discuss Less is More, How to Maximize Energy Savings and Plastics Processing, Part 1, because this is the first in a two-part series. Now, Josh Bachman is a Director of Customer Engagement at Cascade Energy, where he's responsible for business development and sales with Cascade's demand side management and corporate customers. An engineer by training, Josh has over 20 years of experience in the energy efficiency industry, including leading Cascade's engineering team and designing and launching the Bonneville Power Administration's award-winning Energy Smart Industrial Program. Pam Burkle is a program manager and senior strategic energy management coach at Cascade. Pam provides SEM coaching for multiple utility demand side management programs. She has led dozens of commercial and industrial SEM projects and in so doing has worked with hundreds of different end users. Pam is an excellent communicator and problem solver with a keen understanding of how to incorporate energy savings changes that will contribute to a company's success. Now, with that, let's give a big welcome to Josh and Pam and I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, Connor, thank you for the, the nice introduction. And uh, just wanna say on behalf of Cascade, thank you uh, to SPE for the opportunity to present today, talk a bit about our experience um, working with several plastics plants, finding opportunities where uh, energy is being wasted, figuring out um, and figuring out what we can do to capitalize on those opportunities, cut energy waste, deliver co uh, cost savings to plastic plants, and very oftentimes uh, tapping into utility programs that provide uh, funding for Cascade to work with plastic plants and also provide funding um, for plastic plants to implement these projects to offset the cost of uh, improving the energy efficiency of their facilities. We'll jump into the presentation here. Here we go. So Connor gave us a nice introduction. So I'm going to start with a just quick overview of Cascade uh, and energy use at plastic plants. Um, then we'll dive into two focal areas uh, for saving energy at plastics facility, compressed air systems and chilled water systems. We'll talk about, you know, what are sort of the fundamentals with each of those systems around energy, what are some of the good opportunities to key into saving energy on those systems. Uh, then once we cover that, I'm going to pass the baton to Pam. Pam's going to talk about a case study, uh, a project that she led for Hunter Industries down in Southern California. Uh, where they were able to achieve significant cost savings uh, focused on some of the measures that we'll discuss today and again tapping into incentives from their utility san diego gas and electric um, that not only provided funding for our costs but also provided significant funding towards the implementation costs of the energy efficiency measures there we're going to do our, going to do our best to leave about 15 minutes at the end uh, for q a um, so with that let's jump into it so quick overview on Cascade. Uh, we've been in business uh, coming up in about 30 years now. Uh, Pam and I, we're both based in Portland, Oregon. Um, so we're just getting started today. Um, our headquarters are in the Pacific Northwest. That's really where our roots are. Uh, the last 10 years or so, we've been expanding uh, to the south and, and to the east. Um, and we've worked with a number of plastic plants throughout the years. Um, some of my first projects as an engineer, uh, roughly 20 years ago when I started at Cascade, um, were at plastics facilities. Uh, and certainly, especially as we've moved into the Midwest and the Northeast, um, we've been working with just more and more plastic plants over the years. Our focus at Cascade is on industrial energy efficiency. Um, so we don't work with we don't work with homes, we don't work with commercial buildings. 90% plus of what we do 
is at industrial facilities. And we really serve all industrial types. Um, beyond plastic plants, that lower left-hand corner, um, that's a photo of a 10,000 horsepower motor uh, powering a refiner at a pulp and paper mill. Uh, we do a lot of work in the wastewater treatment sector, uh, which you see in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, and then the lower right-hand corner, that's an engine room um, for a, a um, hog processing facility, engine room for a, a large central ammonia refrigeration system that's part of their process there. As I mentioned, you know, a lot of the work that we do is in these utility programs. Um, we do work directly for plastics facilities to help them save energy at their plants. Um, but the bulk of the work that we've done over the years with plastics facilities is through these utility incentive programs. Um, certainly out west where our roots are, uh, and now in the Midwest and the Northeast as well. Um, many of you are probably familiar with these programs. You've participated with them in the past. Um, that's something that we always want to take advantage of anytime you're looking to build a facility or do a major retrofit or capital up upgrade at your plant. You always want to talk to your utility, see if there's something that you can tap into um, to help, you know, identify good opportunities to save energy and get that funding to help offset the cost of implementing those measures. So let's talk about just energy costs for plastics facilities and what's at stake overall. So this map here gives you an idea of, of energy rates, electric energy rates um, throughout the United States. Um, this is from 2019. Um, and you know what we can see is that you know there is a big diversity of rates across the country. You know, Pam and I, we're here in the Pacific Northwest. We've got a big hydroelectric infrastructure here um, that provides us relatively cheap power. Um, down in California, where Pam's going to share uh, the case study for Hunter Industries, it's, it's a different story. Electricity is much more expensive there. Uh, I think down in San Diego, where Pam's going to talk about, energy rates are, you know, 20 cents a kilowatt hour or more. And obviously, when your rate is that high, you know, there's certain projects that are going to pencil in that territory um, that may not make sense in other regions. Northeast is another area with high rates. Uh, and then the center of the country, um, you know, tends to be, you know, right about average, you know, seven cents a kilowatt hour is probably the average industrial rate, I would say, for a plastics facility. Um, and, you know, there's a big diversity in size of plastic plants, of course. Uh, 20 million kilowatt hours, I'd say, is probably a good average. So 20 million kilowatt hours or, or 20 gigawatt hours. Uh, and at that seven cents a rate, that translates into about a $1.4 million annual electric cost, you know, for your average plastic plant. So that's really what's at stake here when we talk about saving electricity to a plastics plant. You know, you're somewhere in that probably one to $2 million range in terms of an energy spend. And what we typically see is that there's savings potential of at least 10%. Um, a lot of that is from capital upgrades, but a significant amount is from O&M low and no cost type opportunities. So, you know, we want to think about how can we do the best you can with what you have? You know, what sort of set point changes can we make? What sort of operational strategies can we put in place? How can we help you do the best you can with what you have? Get those low and no cost savings. And then once we've optimized existing, then let's focus on those capital up upgrades. Um, we can probably get about half of those savings from low and no cost improvements and then the other half of those savings from those capital projects. So where is the energy going? Um, today, we're going to focus exclusively on electrical energy use. Um, that tends to be the, the dominant energy cost for plastics plants. Um, you know, natural costs can be significant as well, um, but usually electric is, is that dominant cost. So we've got a couple examples here. Of course, you know, all plants are different. Um, they're all little snowflakes, of course, um, but, you know, this is kind of a, a breakdown for two types of plants that we've been to. We've got a thin film plant and a bottle plant in this example. And, you know, what we're seeing here is that, you know, typically about half the energy use, you know, it's out in the production floor, um, driving the equipment that you're using to, to manufacture plastics products. And then about another, you know, third to a half is what I would call utilities. You know, things like compressed air and chilled water that we're going to focus on today. So these utilities, they tend to be in an engine room, in a, a back part of the facility that, that very few people go to. 
Uh, and for the most part, they're sort of out of sight, out of mind. People don't really care about what's going on with the compressed air system. They just care that they have enough pressure out of the plant. They don't care about what's going on with the chilled water system. They just care that they've got, you know, 50 degree chilled water um, out on the production floor. And so that really, it actually presents a good opportunity for us to focus on those utilities. Um, because, you know, they're, they tend to be fairly standard from one plant to the next, whereas what you're doing out on the production floor can be fairly custom. And also they're just maybe not quite as sensitive as, your, as the heart of your plant, that production area. Um, so we've got a little more latitude for what we do on your compressed air system, on your chilled water system, you know, when we focus on those utilities. So they give us that, that blend of, you know, significant energy use and significant opportunity and also latitude to, to make changes, to find opportunities to cut energy waste. So with that background, let's talk first about compressed air systems and what some of the fundamentals are um, to saving energy on a compressed air system. So compressed air is used throughout manufacturing, including plastics, of course. Uh, and there's good reason for it. It is just an amazing utility. Um, it's very simple to use. It's not going to shock you like like an electrical uh, like electricity will. Um, it's great for for really you know ugly environments. You know there's no cleanup associated with compressed air. If you've got a, a dirty application, I talked about like that pulp and paper mill where there was that huge motor. You know those are are very challenging environments for industry for equipment to operate in. Compressed air is a great application there. Um, it provides us power in a very small device, um, which means we can fit it into small places. It can be lightweight. And of course, if the compressed air leaks, if it spills, it's not a big deal, right? Um, might make a loud noise. It could hurt you, of course. Uh, but in general, you know, compressed air is pretty safe to use. But there is a big downside to compressed air, and it's just that it's, it's fundamentally very inefficient. About Typically, it's about 15% efficient at best. So what that means is that for every seven units of energy that we put into our air compressor, we only get about one unit of useful work out of it. So 85% of that energy right off the bat is basically going towards heat, towards waste heat. So compressed air, I mean, it's a very, it's a great utility. It's easy to use, it's ubiquitous but it is very expensive to use. It is very efficient and we wanna be mindful of where we're using it. In this example here, you know, a hundred horsepower air compressor, that's gonna cost you about $50,000 a year to operate at that seven cents a kilowatt hour rate. Um, but again, it's only producing at best about 15 horsepower of actual meaningful work that we can tap into. That 15 horsepower electric motor, you know, it's going to cost us only $7,500 a year to operate. So again, just huge discrepancy. If there's any application where we can use an electric motor instead of air power, that's great. If there's an application where we can use, like, say, a, a blower instead of compressed air, we want to take advantage of it because typically those are going to use significantly less energy uh, than using compressed air. So how we save energy on compressed air systems? You know, the good news, this isn't rocket science. Um, there's about 10 fundamental areas that we focus on in terms of minimizing compressed air and energy use, um, improving efficiency or finding more efficient ways, more efficient alternatives than compressed air to get the job done. So we list these out here. We're going we're gonna to dive into a few of these a little bit more deeply. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, we'll talk about chilled water after compressed air. And for chilled water systems, really so many of these um, fundamental ways that we save energy also apply there. You know, we want to minimize the load. We want to, you know, use as little compressed air as possible. Same with chilled water. We want to do as little cooling as we have to do. Um, we always want to use our best part load option. So that's focusing on the supply side, whether we're talking about air compressors or chillers. You know, our compressors, they're going to have different levels of efficiency, not only at full load, but then particularly at part load. So if we only need 50% of an air compressor, um, that, can, that can mean a big difference if we're using compressor A versus compressor B 
in terms of how much energy they use at that part load operation. Simple stuff, you know, we always want to turn off equipment when we don't need that. You know, whether that's an air compressor that's sitting idle or maybe an application where we're using compressed air. You know, compressed, uh, compressed air lines are notorious for leaking. If we've got a line that only operates, you know, during the day shift that we're feeding compressed air to, you know, we want to valve that off after that day shift, not be feeding those leaks uh, during those off hours when we're not actually using those equip that equipment. So I won't go through this whole list here, um, but again, you know, these are sort of the 10 key way, 10 key things that we focus on when it comes to saving air, uh, energy on a compressed air system. So again, compressor air compressor systems, notorious for leaks. Um, you know, what we typically see is about 30% of an, an air compressor's load is going towards feeding leaks. And again, many of those leaks, you know, they're happening on equipment that isn't in operation all the time. So we want to think about, you know, how can we isolate those systems? What can we do to prevent leaking that air when equipment is actually not in use? Ultrasonic leak detector, that's a great tool for finding these leaks. Um, it's a big job to go around and, and detect all these leaks. And it's something, it's kind of a never ending battle. Um, we've got compressed air leak tags that we take out when we do these sort of tests. So we can flag all the leaks, assign people the job to fix those leaks. But at the end of the day, it's a never ending job. It's something that you're gonna have to probably do on at least a quarterly basis um, to manage all those leaks in your plant. And here we've got an example of, what, of how much they cost you. Um, from a sixteenth of an inch to a quarter inch. Um, at a quarter inch, you know, that's a huge leak. That's a huge expense. It's something that you're going to walk by and, and notice for sure. Um, but this is how it adds up at that seven cents a kilowatt hour um, rate um, when we can fix those leaks within your facility. So we always want to think about, first and foremost, you know, how are we using compressed air? Is there something that we could use in the place of compressed air um, that's gonna be suitable for that application, effective for that application and use less energy? So, you know, poor uses of compressed air, and um, we've got a bunch listed here, you know, just open blowing, ag open blowing applications, uh, you know, things like sparging where we're say mixing a tank or stirring ingredients, you know, that's a, a pretty inefficient use of compressed air relative to a mechanical mixer. Um, vacuum generation we've seen, you know, cabinet cooling for electrical cabinets. Again, there's good alternatives to compressed air that we can use for cooling. Um, material transport, you know, for moving bottles along, moving cans along, you know, can we use blowers instead of compressed air for that? Uh, we see, of course, a lot of diaphragm pumps out in the field. Um, those are fantastic pumps for moving all sorts of things. Um, but again, they're a big compressed air user. There's electric options now for diaphragm pumps um, that we can think about using instead. And then we also see, you know, kind of similar to sparging or agitating, compressed air being used for vibration applications. Again, there's mechanical alternatives that we can consider for those. Uh, they're going to use for use significantly less air. So. You know, when you walk through your plant, when you think about building a new facility or building a new line, you know, we really want to scrutinize each one of those uses of compressed air and consider, you know, is there an alternative that we can use here um, that will get the job done and do it for much less energy? I talked a little bit about, you know, part load operation and capacity control of compressors. So for your, you know, say 100 to 120 pound applications for compressed air, um, you know, predominantly what we see, at least for um, like sort of non-food grade applications, is folks using oil flooded screw compressors. Those are sort of the workhorses of the industry. Um, great machines, super reliable, get the job done. Uh, but there can really be a big difference in the part load operation of these machines. So again, we don't always need 100% capacity of that compressor. We may only need 70% of it or 50% of it. And there's a big difference in how a screw compressor may control its capacity um, you know, at those different operations. So kind of the most common low cost way of doing it is called inlet modulation or inlet throttling. Um, we're basically, we're restricting 
the inlet of that compressor. We're choking it, if you will, um, to effectively make it a smaller machine. You know, that is a very inefficient way of controlling the, the capacity of that compressor. If we could, if we could close that valve all the way and get down to 0% capacity, you know, that compressor would still draw 70% of its full load power. So at that point, we're essentially, we're getting no useful work out of that compressor. We're getting no output out of it, but it's still using 70% of full load power. Another option for air compressors that we see is what's called load unload control. That's where basically the compressor operates at fully loaded. It drives up the system pressure, gets to a, a certain set point, kind of like the thermostat in your house, and then it idles off. And that pressure goes down, 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 gets to a certain low pressure set point, uh, and then it kicks back up again. And so there's a, a pretty big difference in range in terms of how much power uh, a, an oil flooded screw might use when it's uh, fully unloaded um, from manufacturer to manufacturer. So that definitely impacts the, the part load energy use of a load unload machine. And that's why we've got two examples there. The other thing that really impacts it is how much air storage that we have in the system. So, you know, you can pretty much safely say that you can never have enough air storage in the system. It's sort of like, you know, putting water behind the dam uh, if you will, on your compressed air system. And the more storage volume that we have in our system, the more just sort of dwell time that we can have between that compressor loading, unloading, that makes the system more stable. It also just makes it more fundamentally efficient because there's some transient losses every time we load and unload those machines. And sort of the less loading and unloading we can do, um, the less of those losses we incur. So, you know, the key to a good load unload operation is having a, a, a machine that has a, a low uh, power usage when unloaded and having sufficient air storage volume to just sort of minimize uh, how often it's it's bouncing back and forth between that load and unload operation. And then typically the best case um, scenario is having a, a, variable speed, a variable speed compressor. Um, when I started in this industry, VFD driven compressors, they were sort of just getting started. They weren't really accepted technology. Um, that, that's really changed over the years. Uh, and certainly, you know, every manufacturer is gonna offer, offer a good VFD compressor oper, um, uh, option for you, um, for your new construction consideration. Um, you know, retrofitting air compressors with VFDs, we don't see a ton of that, um, but sometimes it is possible. And, and typically the other thing is that Usually you only need one uh, VFD air compressor on your system. So what we like to do is, you know, have your sort of your biggest compressor on your team, be that VFD machine. And then you can have some other compressors that don't have VFDs on them. Uh, maybe they're just inlet modulated machines. You know, we're gonna operate those, those compressors, those inlet modulated machines, we're gonna operate them fully loaded or off. And then we're gonna use that single VFD machine to trim our load. So it's going to be the trim compressor where it's adjusting speed up and down to make up that difference to maintain our plant pressure. So this is an example of a, a bottling plant that I worked with a few years ago. Um, and some of the things that we're seeing here. So these folks, they had a, a high pressure system that we'll talk about next um, used for blow molding applications. And then they had what they called their low pressure system, which largely supported like their injection molding machines. And you can see that, you know, from a pressure standpoint, you know, it takes more energy to, to obviously make a higher pressure out of our air compressors. They just weren't making good use of that pressure. So they were operating their system at about 180 pounds. And then right away, they were regulating it down to 150 pounds before sending it out to the plant. So right there, you know, there's a, you know, roughly 25, 30 pound pressure loss that we're incurring in the system just from the get go. And then at our injection molding machines, we did some high frequency data logging where we were capturing air pressure, I think like every 0.04 seconds or something like that. And you can see just huge fluctuations in pressure, um, you know, as our actual actuators are striking. So, you know, we're typically holding that 130 pound pressure, um, we operate our actuators, you know, it's going down to as low as about 100 pounds pressure. 
So at the end of the day, you know, we're running compressors at 180 pounds to ultimately get about 100 pounds um, at our actual device that we're powering that's, that's determining that pressure we operate our compressors at. You know, so for these guys, what they were able to do is again, put some, put some air storage capacity out at the plant floor. So again, you know, there's never so, to, a thing as too much air storage capacity. They put air tanks by each one of their injection molding machines to help stabilize that pressure at the molding machine so they didn't get that big drop off um, every time it struck. And that allowed us to fundamentally just lower the pressure overall of the system because now we weren't getting such huge dips in pressure um, out, at, uh, out at our devices. And then on the high pressure side um, at, the, at this plant, again, this is a bottling plant, they operated these three stage um, reciprocating compressors, making air at like around 600 PSI. Uh, and those machines, they had good part load control. Um, they would only draw about say 10% power um, when idled. Uh, but the problem was, is they ran these machines 24 uh, seven and left them idling for hours and hours upon time because they didn't really have good controls on them. And these are huge machines ranging from 750 horsepower uh, down to 300 horsepower. And you can see on this slide, you know, their, their energy use when idling, you know, again, it's about 10% of nameplate horsepower, but a number of these machines pretty much idled year round. Uh, and at the end of the day, th that adds up. They were spending about, you know, over $50,000 a year, basically powering these machines when they were idling and doing no useful work for them. So then the other part of our project on the high pressure side was to get them good controls. So, you know, we put in a sequencer that controlled all five of these machines, would allow them to be turned off when they'd been idling for a sufficiently long time. And then the other neat thing that they did is they took out all their regulators out on the plant um, on this high pressure system and instead chart and installed a, a central regulator, um, which you can see there in the upper right hand corner that basically gave them a constant steady pressure um, for the plant floor. They put a big 2,500 gallon tank behind that regulator. And not only were they able to reduce the pressure that they were able to operate at, which saved them energy on their compressors, also reduced the air use uh, on any sort of leaks that they would have on the system, but it just gave them a more steady pressure. Um, you know, rather than ping ponging um, back between, in between pressures as they stage compressors on and off, they could really operate in a much tighter pressure band. This project saved this plant about $100,000. Um, it had a four year payback before incentives, um, but the utility chipped in covered about half the half of the project cost and brought it down to a two year payback, um, which met this facility's criteria for implementation, allowed them to go forward with it. So some quick rules of thumb here. I talked about it before, but there's that seven to one ratio. So for every seven units of power we put into that air compressor, we only get about one unit of useful work out of it. So again, just very inefficient, um, it's a great utility, but very inefficient. We really want to scrutinize where we're using compressed air. Is there a better alternative we can put it in place? Uh, in terms of reducing the discharge pressure on our systems, if we're talking about that, you know, typical 100 to 120 pound system, for every two pounds that you can reduce discharge pressure, you reduce about 1% of that air compressor's energy use. So if we can drop our pressure by 10 pounds, um, which is as often something that's achievable, we can save 5% of our energy use. And that it may not cost us a thing to do that. It could be something as simple as a set point change. And then lastly, for those oil flooded screw compressors, inlet modulation, inlet throttling, that's the typical way that you do capacity control. You know, those compressors, they're gonna draw about 70% of full load power when they're fully unloaded, doing no useful work for you. So inlet modulation, very inefficient form of capacity control on, on oil flooded screw compressors. We want to have a good uh, part load machine, whether it's load unload or a VFD screw um, to be our trim compressor to negate that big part load penalty.
again, we've got our, our 10 things to look for here on your compressed air system. And then at Cascade, we've developed a, a do-it-yourself a guide for how to save energy on a compressed air system. This is a, a, a four-page process um, that you can walk through your plant with to identify opportunities and think about what sort of alternatives you could use uh, to save, save energy use on your compressed air system. I've got a link here to our website. If you go to our website, you can download this uh, do-it-yourself guide. Um, and I'll show this again here at the very end of our presentation. Um, it's, a, it's a really great resource. I definitely encourage you to go to our website and uh, download this for your use. With that, I'm gonna jump into chilled water systems. I'm a little bit behind schedule, so I'm gonna try to move through this a little bit more quickly so we can uh, get to that case study that Pam, Pam has to share. So, you know, chilled water, fundamentally, you know, big energy user at plastic plants, uh, it's gonna, it's more complex than a compressed air system for sure. Um, there's just a lot more equipment involved. Um, you definitely have kind of have to have more of a systems mentality thinking about, you know, okay, how is this change gonna impact my chilled water pumps? How is it gonna impact my chiller? How is this gonna flow to our, our cooling tower? Um, so it's a little bit more difficult to isolate equipment in a chilled water system uh, versus a compressed air system. You definitely have to have that sort of system-wide mentality when you think about making energy efficiency improvements on this system type. So, you know, chilled water, that's what we're trying to get out of these systems. That's what has value to us. Um, you know, we typically see plants that are looking to supply anywhere from say, you know, 45 to 55 degree water out to the facility um, for these chilled water applications. And we've got three loops, right? We've got our chilled water loop, you know, that's going out to the plant. We've got our refrigerant loop that's occurring within that, that chiller itself. Uh, and then we've got our condenser loop. Um, this is a water-cooled chiller example where we're using a cooling tower. We're using water-cooled condensing on it. There are, of course, air-cooled condensing uh, chillers that we see out in applications as well. So let's focus first on the, the chilled water side. And so again, there's a mix of, of O&M or, or low and no cost improvements that we can do on a chilled water system along with good capital project opportunities. Um, so, you know, going back to those rules of thumb from compressed air, you know, we wanna turn off equipment that's not in use. You know, that's easy stuff, right? Easy ways to save energy. Um, it's not complicated, but we have to think about, you know, what are the barriers that might be preventing us from turning equipment off, whether it's controls, or certain um, needs out in the plant, we really have to understand that before we can do something as simple as turn equipment off. Um, we wanna think about what's that chilled water supply temperature set point? What do we really need for our applications out in the plant? Um, you know, this is where uh, you've probably heard about the, the Toyota mindset of asking the five whys. You know, that's the approach that we wanna take with chilled water temperature set point. You know, why do you need this temperature set point? Okay, so what happens if we operate at a higher set point? You know, really sort of investigate what are those loads out in the plant? You know, what temperature do they truly need? And is there opportunity to raise it a little bit? Because if we can, it's gonna provide huge cost savings for us. Again, how we stage our chillers, just as important how we do it with compressors, understanding the different part load performance of one chiller versus the next. We wanna operate, you know, our efficient part load machine as our trim. Those ones that aren't as efficient at part load, we want those to be our base, base load. And most chilled water systems, there's gonna be some amount of bypass flow um, to make sure that each chiller is receiving its minimum, um, a minimum amount of flow through the barrel. We really wanna understand, you know, what are those requirements for chillers? You know, can we reduce that bypass flow? Because again, we're not really getting any useful work out of it. We're just spinning water around in a circle. You know, what does the equipment manufacturer say about those bypass flow set points? Then on the capital side, you know, again, speed control, it's great for not only chillers, uh, but also for chilled water pumps. We can really improve that part load operation by using speed control. Uh, and then in particular, if you live in a cool climate or have a, you know, relatively high chilled water temperature, you know, there may be a good portion of the year that we can basically use, you know, quote unquote, free cooling um to, to cool that chilled water so 
you know, basically take the chiller out of the loop and let's just use that cooling tower water to cool down our chilled water, get the job done within the facility. This graph gives you an example of um, different efficiencies of centrifugal chillers. You know, these are water cooled applications. Um, so one thing you'll note is that, you know, chiller energy, it's going to increase as our condensing water temperature increases. Um, so that yellow, those yellow lines along the bottom, you know, those are at a 55 degree condensing water temperature. That red line along the top, that's at an 85 degree condensing water temperature. And so basically the higher the condensing water temperature, the higher the refrigerant pressure is within that chiller and the more energy it takes for that chiller compressor to compress that refrigerant from suction pressure to discharge pressure. So we always wanna be operating at as low of a condensing water temperature as outdoor conditions allow and as that chiller manufacturer specifies. So most chiller manufacturers are gonna tell you, hey, there's, there's a certain condensing water temperature that you can only go down to and, and still properly operate the equipment. You know, a good rule of thumb with chilled water systems is you get about a 1% improvement in efficiency at the chiller um, for every one degree change that we can lower um, that condensing water temperature set point. And then the other thing you'll see here is just the big difference um, between VS, which are variable speed chillers, uh, and CS, which are constant speed chillers. And I apologize, I should have called that out at the start. Um, what's interesting here is with those variable speed chillers, often we see that they're even more efficient at part load um, than they are at full load. And then the other big thing here is that as we get to a lower uh, condensing water temperature, the difference in efficiency between a constant speed chiller and variable speed chiller um, at part load becomes even more prevalent. So our variable speed chiller is even more efficient uh, at those lower condensing water temperatures um, than the high ones. I'm going to keep moving quickly here. Um, so, you know, different pumping system setups that we see out there, you know, primary and secondary systems, um, even tertiary systems that we sometimes see in plants where there's a, a third pumping loop. Uh, and then we, we are starting to see more of these variable flow systems or variable primary flow systems um, where we're using VFDs on our pump. We've got two way valves on our applications. And rather than just bypassing a lot of flow around loads when they're not calling for cooling, we're actually gonna close that two way valve and um, slow down the pumps rather than just bypassing flow around loads that are, are not calling for cooling. So that, that's a great way to save pumping energy, of course. So, you know, here's a control screen on a chiller. Um, you know, if we're looking for O&M opportunities on it, I look at this screen, you know, one thing that I see is that our, our evaporator leaving water temperature down in the lower, lower left-hand corner, you know, it's set for 40 degrees. That's a pretty low set point. Again, that's something that we really want to scrutinize. Can we raise that set point a degree or two? If we can, and if we can do it at no cost, you know, that's a significant cost savings opportunity for it. The other thing I see here is that set point source. So I'm not sure what these different options necessarily mean when I'm an engineer walking into this facility for the first time, but I wanna understand, okay, what, what is ultimately controlling that set point? You know, what does EXT-FP mean? Let's investigate that, um, find out what the root is there. Um, because again, that set point has a huge impact on our energy use. We really wanna understand what it's rooted in. Cooling tower side, I'll go ahead and skip through um, the basics of a cooling tower. Um, but again, these can be a good opportunity to save further energy on our chilled water system. Um, you know, fan cycling is typically what we see on cooling towers where fans are, you know, going on and off, maintaining a temperature um, dead band on that leaving condensing water temperature. You know, VFD control is more efficient than fan cycling control. So, you know, if we need to fan 50% of a time and we're cycling it off on and off, it's gonna use 50% of, en of its energy uh, in that instance. Um, with fans, we have a thing called the affinity laws where basically there's a cubic relationship between speed and power. And so what that means is we, when we run a fan at half speed, we actually use 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 the power or 20% of full load energy use. 
So if we're if we need a fan 50% of the time and we're cycling it, we're going to use 50% energy use. If we're using a VFD instead and operating at 50% speed, we're going to use 20% energy use. You're going to get that 30% delta uh, on energy consumption. Condenser pumps, you know, typically those are operated, you know, at a fixed speed. Um, there are opportunities to cycle them on and off. Doing speed control on condenser pumps is, is relatively rare. Uh, and then here's a list of our O&M and capital project opportunities. So again, if we can decrease that condensing water temperature uh, to the extent that outdoor conditions allow us and the chiller manufacturers ratings allow us, we're gonna save energy. Our cooling tower is gonna work a little bit hard, harder making cooler condenser water, uh, but you're gonna make up those save, you're gonna make up for that energy use and more with your chiller energy use going down because your chiller is gonna be able to operate at a, a fundamentally lower refrigerant pressure internally. Um, you know, the best case, the way you can control it best to outdoor conditions is to base it off of wet bulb temperature outside. Um, that allows us to give a good target condensing water temperature, leaving that cooling tower. Um, if we have VFDs, um, we want to make good use of them. We want to control all our VFDs at the same speed. Um, that gives us the best part load efficiency. And typically, you know, we want to control those, those speeds within a band. So energy use on a fan VFD really spikes up above like say 80% speed. So if we can hold that fan below 80% speed, um, we can get some significant energy savings there. Um, and then on the capital side, again, you know, VFDs on fan v on cooling tower fans, um, good, op good application on the cooling tower pump. You know, that's a tricky application. We don't see it very often. If you're in that new construction mode, um, we really want to oversize those cooling towers to the extent we can. You know, we get we want to get as much you know cooling out of those applications so we can get cool condenser water. Ultimately, operate our chillers more efficiently. With that, I'm going to pass the baton to Pam, um, who's going to talk about a case study at Hunter Industries, a plastics manufacturer down in Southern California. Pam, hi. Thanks for having me today. Um, Josh, I'm going to be asking you to change the slides, so I'll say next. So uh, this is Hunter Industries. They're in San Marcos, California, which is outside of San Diego. Um, they have 11 buildings on their campus, and four of them um, are manuf manufacturing buildings that we were working with um, through the San Diego Gas and Electric Program. Next. So they make um, plastic injection molded um, sprinkler parts. Um, these aren't their products, but their products are, are perhaps similar to this, although I don't think they'd agree with me. Um, so uh, pretty, pretty big business. And if you're in the irrigation business, you've certainly heard of them. Um, and uh, we'll move on into some of their opportunities next. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so we um, we're doing what we call a strategic energy management program or SEM program. And this is a program that's administered by SDG&E. So San Diego Gas and Electric is our is our client. And um, through them, we have recruited seven of their biggest customers to be in this cohort um, that would last two years. Um, so um, the Cohorts are workshop based and what you see in that picture is is a workshop. So we have eight workshops over two years. Uh, next, Josh. And the biggest event really of the whole SEM engagement is what we call a treasure hunt, um, similar to a Kaizen um, event, but where we bring our engineers out to meet pe with people from Hunter. Um, in this case, we had three folks on the Cascade team and 12 people from Hunter. And we form teams and really go through the plant, scour it. We ask a lot of questions, um, work with them to uh, find opportunities for saving energy. Uh, next, Josh. And this is this. This slide shows at the end of the day. Then we write down all our um, 
all our ideas on sticky notes and sort them and prioritize them in terms of, you know, what's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck? You know, what's the low hanging fruit here? Okay, next, Josh. So the um, projects that we've found or that we've worked on, or, and I should say we came away with 76 um, energy projects as a result of the treasure hunt and Hunter continues to add projects to that list. So we had a lot to work on, so a lot to sort and a lot to prioritize. But you could generally categorize those opportunities into building, uh, building utilities, such as Josh talked about compressed air, chilled water, HVAC. And then there's also a lot of opportunity um, in process heat removal. Next. So we're going to look at a few projects. And first, we're going to look at their overall energy graph. And this is what we call a um, um, QSUM graph. So the red line, um, the one sloping down, um, is their total energy savings over the two-year program. And down is good, so don't be alarmed that it's going down. Sometimes we do these graphs with down good for energy savings. So this is showing over the two years, they saved over 2 million kilowatt hours. And the way this, um, in SEM, the way um, savings are calculated are by building an energy model to represent their energy usage normalized for their production um, during a period prior to the SEM program. So we build a model and then the blue line in this graph represents what, um, what that model says energy use would be. So you can think of that as the line that shows where they would be if they weren't doing SEM. And then we measure um, their actual energy use at the meter, and that's the green line. So it comes the difference between the blue line and the green line is cumulatively added up to form the red line. And this is a graph from Sensei. This is some um, energy management software that Cascade has developed. Um, so there's, there are a lot of visualization um, um, op opportunities here. And you can see along the bottom, these little um, gray rectangles are um, completed projects, so you can make correlations between completed projects and the, and the pace of their energy savings. So let's look at some of those projects. Next, Josh. Um, there's one on chilled water here, and um, tying into what Josh was talking about, but they added VFDs on three um, process chilled water pumps. So those were installed in November 2020. Um, and after they've been working, the valuation shows that they're saving 207,000 kilowatt hours per year. So for Hunter, Josh talked about the high energy costs in, in the Southern California region. For Hunter, they use 23 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's huge. And so you can see their savings from that project for $47,000. So they also received an incentive from SDG&E and the payback for that project was 5.3 months. So very easy um, in their calculations to make that project happen. Next. Um, and this is uh, another image from Sensei, the energy management software where we track those projects. And I don't expect you to be able to see what it says, but this gives us an opportunity to describe the project, describe the steps that need to be done, enter um, due dates for those projects, assign them to people, and to take notes on the project. So we use Sensei quite a bit for that, the, the participants tracking system for projects. Next. And uh, um, some more compressed air projects. So um, they weren't shutting off the air valves, the compressed air valves at the machines when they were not in use. And they were not in use a lot of the time. So by doing this at, at all of their buildings, they saved 290,000 kilowatt hours a year. They also reduced system pressure and they're continuing to lower this. Um, they're from 103 to 90 and continuing to go down. But for this compressed air um, work, they're saving $73,000 a year. Next, some projects around um, heat, process heat removal. So ducting um, uh, heat related equipment to outside heat producing equipment. So uh, plastic dryers and, um, re and resin room um, by ducting those 
things to the outside, that's saving energy because then you're not trying to cool that, um, that warm air that's coming off the machines in your spaces. Um, and in the, on the third line there, repairing that exhaust line, that was, um, there was an exhaust line in place, but it was regardless, it was cut and it was exhausting right into the room. So by repairing that, there were big savings there. Um, next, Josh. And those are generally HVAC savings. Those are air conditioning savings, electric savings. They also did a lot of um, HVAC schedules and setbacks. So programming into their building management system, uh, the hours of operation and um, you know, really cut, turning back the system when there aren't people there. Um, and that, that represented some big savings as well. Go ahead, Josh. And they have some projects in process as we speak. Um, I should say they started in 2018, so they've been in the program for two and a half years. Um, they have a neat project at the top there where they're um, installing uh, insulated barrel heaters. So their barrel heaters on their machines, they have um, insulation blankets, but they're kind of in the way so people move them and they don't end up getting insulated. So they're installing a product that has the heating element in the insulation so it can't be removed. So they're going to do that on 10 machines. They're trying it on one first. Um, they also have a long-term project of uh, replacing hydraulic molding machines with electric um, expensive project, but also big, save, big yearly savings there and a number of other um, compressed air projects. Um, these projects add up to about $1.5 million if they complete all of them. Um, a lot of that is, of course, from replacing the machines, which is going to be an expensive project to do. Um, but on their list still, we have a lot of good projects beyond these that I've talked about. Next. So after two years in the program, that was the original term of the program, they saved 8.8% on electricity is over a million kilowatt hours or $250,000 per year. Um, they don't have huge natural gas use, but they did save a little through those HVAC projects. Next. And they received incentives through the program, um, $10,000 for being in the program and meeting certain milestones, and they got an incentive from the utility. They've completed 25 energy projects so far, mostly low or no cost. That's what SEM programs focus on for the most part, operations and maintenance projects that don't cost them anything to implement. A lot more projects in progress. Um, there's really, a nice side of the program that it leads to recognition and growth for the people on the energy team that maybe don't have that much visibility within a, within a company. And they also get some um, public recognition in a way because the results are being reported in their CSR um, report, their corporate uh, sustainability report. And Hunter, I should mention, is very big on corporate um, sustainability. Um, and so this program fit really well into their um, goals. And uh, San Diego Gas and Electric decided to continue the program into years three and four. And Hunter is continuing there and we continue to work with them. Next. And so what the keys to their success, I think are really, if you could go back, Josh. Um, their keys to their success are their um, corporate oversight. So they have corporate support, kind of the I, efforts towards energy savings start from the top down and the efforts of the team are really supported by the company. And then they've just got a great energy team making sure these projects happen. They ha it's basically a team of two people, one who manages the projects and one the head of engineering who um, has great leadership skills and is able to delegate these projects to people to, to get them done. And they've just really been an effective uh, combination. Next. Thank you, Pam. Oh um, so, you know, big takeaways here. Uh, you know, there's significant opportunities to save at plastic plants. Um, you know, like you saw in Pam's example, you know, on the order of about 10% savings uh, is, is very realistic for most facilities. 
Uh, we talked about, you know, maybe one to two million dollar energy spend being at being the average electric cost for a plastics plant. So 10% of that, you know, that's a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollars on average. If you're in California, it's going to be a lot more. Uh, that's real money. That's something that you can go after. Uh, a lot of those are low and no cost opportunities. And a lot of these opportunities not only save energy, but also just improve your operation overall. Uh, you know, we like to focus on utilities, particularly at the onset. They're big energy users. Um, they're also maybe not as a sensitive an area as, say, uh, you know, replacing a, an injection molding machine. So we have a little bit more latitude to often make changes on a compressed air or chilled water systems. Compressed air, very inefficient. Again, about 15% of our input energy ultimately ends up as useful work. Um, so we want to be very mindful where we use compressed air. On chilled water systems, you know, set points have a huge impact on energy use. Um, the good news is that if we scrutinize those set points, there could be a lot of these low and no cost opportunities to save on them. And like in Pam's example at, at Hunter, um, you know, where you're wasting heat, that often hits you twice, right? Not only are you wasting energy making that heat, but often that's going to be a load on your chilled water or HVAC system that you have to remove. So it, it's you're sort of paying for it twice. And last but not least, you know, we want to take advantage of utility programs anytime they're out there. Um, oftentimes they'll fund Cascade Energy's costs to work with you uh, and or provide funding to help offset the cost of implementing these energy efficiency projects. So with that, um, we went a little bit longer than we were hoping for. Uh, we do we have do a few have minutes a here. Questions there. Questions. Um, so, okay. Uh, Josh, Pam, thank you very much. Uh, this actually okay. brings back a lot of memories for me, actually, because <laughs> uh, I, I worked with some of your colleagues about 10 years ago. And, um, you know, at, at the time, energy efficiency projects had to compete with a lot of other CapEx projects, you know, inside companies. Um, have you seen any shift? in industrial users' attitudes towards these types of projects in the last decade? Um, I would say somewhat. I mean, we have certainly seen a prevalence of, uh, you know, companies setting sustainability goals, you know, being public about, you know, um, what their sustainability mission is and how energy works into it. Um, so the fact that there are public tangible goals out there, I would say is a big advance. Um, I would still say for the majority of the companies that we work with, um, despite that increased visibility and emphasis on energy efficiency, you know, these projects are still competing with all the other capital upgrades at these facilities. Um, so it's, it's, I'd say it's the exception rather than the rule that, that energy efficiency is getting favorable treatment. Um, Pam, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I'm, I'm finding a little more uptake in California. I, I've, I've worked um, in most of the western half of the country, and I'm actually finding a, a little more uptake and openness to it in, um, in Southern California than in other places I've worked. Interesting. All right, so there are a couple of questions from the attendees here. We'll go through those, and then uh, I've might have to invoke moderator privilege because I still have other questions. <laughs> um, in terms of solar power, do you have any information if any plastics manufacturers um, that you know of or processing companies are, are running on solar power either partially or fully? Hunter, the company that I am was illustrating, they have some solar and they're actually going to be adding some more. Okay. I, we in in the thermal farming world where I work now, we actually had a company in California as well in the Bay Area that um, that switched over to solar and are getting I forget the percentage, but they are doing it because the programs and the incentives uh, are pretty attractive for them there. Mm -hmm. um, another question then, considering the two to one rule of thumb for compressed air, does that mean that if you reduce maximum pressure in your process by twenty psi, that would translate into ten percent power reduction? Yeah, that, that's how the rule of thumb works. And again, that's for when you're operating in that roughly 100 pound-ish range. I gave an example of uh, those high pressure blow molders that were running at 600 pounds. The, the rule of thumb wouldn't apply there. It'd be a, you'd get much less bang for your buck reducing your pressure. But for the bulk of systems that we see that operate at that 100 pound-ish type range, two pounds equals 1% savings. 10 pound reduction equals 5% savings. 
Okay. Uh, in addition to utilities, does Cascade also implement changes in the production or plastics processing areas to reduce energy usage? We, we do. Um, and often that's sort of a, a next step in optimizing facilities. You know, if we, we focus on those utilities, um, that's an easier area to operate in. We build sort of credibility and trust with the facility. They, you know, we get some momentum that, hey, we can save energy that's meaningful. And that gives us the momentum to then go out into the plant and start looking at those process improvements um, that can drive further savings. But, you know, again, that's the heart of the plant. And the only way we can make those process improvements is with close collaboration and buy-in, um, you know, from these facilities. Right, I mean, you still have, there's machines and then there's people, uh, yep. you have to work with both of them. In terms of utility programs um, for industrials in particular, um, any comments on, you know, country-wide, nationwide, are there, are there as many or more industrial programs than there are residential or commercial these days? Um, you know, they're just as prevalent as residential and commercial programs in general, Connor. Um, but what you do see in some states or some utilities is where large industrial customers can opt out of these programs. Um, and so if you take the Midwest, for example, um, these programs are fairly prevalent, but a number of states allow large industrial facilities to opt out of them. Um, so you may have a plastics plant that fundamentally has chosen to opt out of that program. That means they're not paying into it through their utility rates. It also means they can't participate in it. Are there, how many of those states are there roughly? I mean, I, I, I know I had spoken to somebody in, um, in Virginia for example, and um, there would have been opportunities for energy savings, but there was no program because somebody right. or several of them had opted out. Yeah, I'd say um, in the Midwest and sort of the mid-Atlantic, that's where we see a lot of, um, of this, these, this ability to opt out and therefore big industrials are not eligible to participate in the programs. Mm -hmm. Out West in the Northeast, um, you know, generally speaking, you're, you're in the program. And you know, there's pros and cons to that, of course. So it, if you are, so you talk about the, the, the all electric machines replacing hydraulics, this has been a, a long sort of well understood process in injection molding in particular uh, and other plastics processing, replacing pneumatics and hydraulics with electrics is a big savings. But is there anything that the OEMs themselves can do to take advantage of any either, you know, utility programs or or something else, or you know, can machinery people, you know, move the needle on behalf of their customers somehow, other mm. than just sort of saying that you know we have a more energy efficient machine, you save money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, beyond just providing a better product, um, you know, OEMs can work with utilities to you know, fundamentally help them understand, you know, how this new technology saves energy. And often we can come, there are opportunities where you can sort of streamline how this, this process for getting incentives work with a particular technology, where rather than say Cascade having to come in and do like a custom analysis of what is the energy savings associated with doing barrel insulation, um, we can sort of just prescribe what that savings is and just kind of give you a, a discount on it without any, with, with a lot less sort of legwork and time lag to go from, I mean, hey, hey, we want to buy this to implementing it. Yeah, I'm actually kind of a broker between the manufacturer of those um, insulated barrel heaters and SDG&E who's considering making them a, a deemed measure that could pay automatic incentives on it. I'm kind of a middle middleman <laughs> between them. Interesting. Is that okay? Then we'll talk uh, more about that on a separate um, separate conversation. And one one last question here from the audience as we're getting ready to go over. But uh, how prevalent is the use of self tampering in the plastics industry? 
Connor, you're broken. Right? Yeah. How, how prevalent is the use of self-temperature tracing cables in the plastics industry? Self-temperature tracing cables. Yeah, I don't, I don't quite understand that. I'm not familiar that. with it. Myself, okay. Um, I can follow up online with the uh, question afterwards and see if we have clarification, but uh, HETA heat tracing. Heat, heat, heat tracing. <laughs> HETA. I, don't see, I, I see it a lot. I don't know that I've seen it in, plas in the plastics um, sites I've worked with. Yeah, so where heat tracing is used, use self-tracing is, is very typical. But yeah, I, I can't speak to, I can't say that I've seen it a lot in plastics plants. Okay, fair enough. Okay, well, Josh and Pam, thank you very much. Um, this is, the, like we say, this is the first of two parts. Um, we're looking forward to the second part at the end of the month. Pam, I think that's gonna be your domain. Um, any final comments from your side? Just really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And thanks for your nice moderation, right. Connor. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And I saw in the chat window there, again, a, uh, that link for downloading that do-it-yourself guide um, for folks that want to have a guide at their plastics plant for how to save energy on their compressed air system. Um, so please feel free to take advantage of that. All right, sounds good. Okay, final reminder, this will be posted uh, and recorded in the SPE library and um, you'll get an email. So but be sure to register for part two coming up at the end of the month with that. Uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, take care.